Hey y'all, we are so excited to announce that we are going back on tour. So far, we plan to visit 15 cities over the summer, starting in Columbus, Ohio on May 11th. At every stop, we'll choose a local topic and perform an episode of Sinisterhood for you live. We'll even throw in a fun bonus segment at the end, where we hear from you in the audience. Tickets for shows are all available now. For all the details, including dates, times, venues, and more, visit Sinisterhood.com slash live shows. That's Sinisterhood.com slash live shows. See you on the road. Content warning. This episode contains discussion of sexual abuse and suicide. Listener discretion is advised. The terror continued for the Sarah Lawrence students as the abuse moved off campus. They were dragged from state to state tormented, assaulted, and broken down systematically. Eventually, word got out about Larry Ray's reign of torture. Two journalists told the victim's stories in harrowing detail, and the results were powerful. This week's episode is Larry Ray and the Sarah Lawrence Cult, Part 2. Up, bump in the night, your heart fills with dread. Probably a murderer who wants you dead It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse It's hopeless, you're doomed You'd call a priest if you could You'd rather just listen to who? Sinisterhood I'm gonna kill you I have since watched videos yeah. since we last recorded and while what we're saying is atrocious and horrifying to see it firsthand is um next level i was jaw on the floor i mean it's like watching anytime you've seen uh footage of prisoners being abused mm-hmm. or something like that where you see uh, someone that's kind of cowering and being either hit with a hammer, their tongues are pulled with pliers, they're slapped, thrown on the ground. It's disturbing. And to, and also watching the reactions of some of the, the people in the videos and you think, man, it really looks like they need to be under the care of oh, yes. a team of medical professionals from yeah. physical and mental health issues and are just in pain. You you kept saying it's almost like it's a guttural animalistic cries mm-hmm. of pain and suffering. Yeah, Felicia especially seems to be suffering a lot in the videos and just it's like watching a caged animal try to mm-hmm. escape just that fight or flight mode and just being manic where you're just like doing or saying anything to try and get out of a situation. It's, it's hard. It's a hard watch. I wanted to see it though. So I, you know, could speak to it better. And, um, any jury that sees those tapes by asshole. Yeah. Well, and you're, we were talking about in one of them, he's kneeling on her back and kind of crushing her on the ground Mm -hmm. and she's screaming simultaneously. I love you. I love you, Larry. I love you so much. I want to marry you. And then in the next breath, get off me, asshole. I hate you. And like you said, you're just saying it's flight or it's fight or flight and you can't even flee because you're being crushed. Mm -hmm. So you're thinking, okay, the other one is freeze or appease is kind of the four reactions to trauma and abuse. And so she starts appeasing. She Mm -hmm. starts thinking, okay, what can I, she tries to fight saying, get off me, asshole, and then tries to appease by saying, I love you. I'll marry you. So you really just see, you know, when you kind of go, from an outsider's perspective, some people may say, well, why don't you just leave? And in a lot of cases, they physically couldn't. No. They get, you were, we'll talk about the different locations that they were taken to far away from family, friends, no money, nothing like that. And then the fear that's instilled in you, it, it truly mm-hmm. does look like prisoners being abused. Oh, yeah. I've said before, I think one thing that I remember learning when I worked at the DV site was. Imagine all the reasons you don't leave just a normal relationship you're unhappy with and then add on abuse, isolation, you don't have a car, you have no money, you've been stripped of autonomy, and it's infinitely worse. And And blackmail in this case, threats of legal. The, The videos are being shot by other people in the house who will discuss their their roles in this, and they're... When Felicia is trying to leave and trying to walk out of a room and somebody's got a phone in your face, 
physically not allowing you to and accusing you of stuff. I mean, she is I it made me anxious and sweaty for her because you feel how trapped she feels and mm-hmm. I would feel so trapped in that situation that you just can't you're you're desperate to get out and you can't no matter what you do and you have no lifeline. And just watching it makes your heart race yeah. because she's there's one where she's in a uh, garage oh, and gosh. she says, yeah. just let me out of this fucking garage. Just let me out of here. And you at, I mean, I asked myself, how long was she trapped in there? Yeah. How long were they forcing her to stay in there? And another one, you know, he's saying you're not mentally well. I'm documenting this right now. They're going to take you away and lock you up. So I think he also demonized mental health professionals, demonized psychiatrists and psychologists and counselors and said, they're all monsters. They're going to lock you up. Only I can help you. So then when that's the very thing you need is medical professionals mm-hmm. to help you, he's now has says, I have this footage and I'm going to get them to come get you. So it really is just like this cycle. So and anytime, we'll, we'll go through it all. Anytime um, she would, I mean, like anybody that's pushed to their limit, you know, I mean, she's a small girl. She's, you know, like tries to like shove him out of the way. And he's like, back up, lady. You're abusing me. You're in my. And yes. so then immediately turns it on her. Like, yes, now you've abused me. I have this on film. So I'm going if you don't stop this behavior, I'm going to call the cops. They're going to see that you're abusing me and take you to jail. It's it is just disgusting to watch. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And and gaslighting and going, oh, mm-hmm. you hurt me when yeah. really she's she's like 100 a hundred pounds. She is a tiny little thing. And I apologize to everyone for the photos we used in the the post on Instagram about it. They were like, we were not ready for seeing him with in his bathrobe oh, with his it, chest exposed. Yeah, yeah. But that's a, that at least gives you some insight into you know how he's built and the fact that a a, a ninety pound, hundred pound girl kind of pushing him away from her in a defensive action Mm -hmm. is in no way injuring him. Mm -mm. But like you said, the narration he's doing is, oh my gosh, you just hit me. Ouch. You abused me. Mm -hmm. Now I have it on tape. Nice try. I have evidence that you're hurting me. It's absolutely ludicrous. But if you've been, I don't know, sleep deprived, food deprived, trapped outside, you would probably believe it. Because this is the person that's your lifeline to food and indoors. So Yeah. She she is in complete distress and Oh man, my heart breaks for her and all of them. All of them, yeah. They have all of them. And yeah, uh sorry that nobody can unsee Larry in that bathrobe. Christ. Yeah. There he's in it in the videos too. He's just sitting around like Keith Raniere, just a schlub. Yes. Just sitting around shirtless commanding things. Yeah, d- demanding things of people shirtless. It's it's repulsive. Mhm. Well, We've already said a lot, and we're about to say a lot more, too. I know that um, everyone was like, we got to have part two. So here it is, as promised. It's coming out this week because we consider Sunday part of this week. Even though Tommy was like, Saturday is the end of the week. I said, nay, nay, in my opinion, the week ends at the end of the weekend. I can't stomach the idea of a week starting on a Sunday. You got Monday mornings are rough enough for right. all of us. Sunday, much less. Give us Sunday, please. Please don't steal Sunday for don't me. Don't take it away. No, so <laughs> take it away. Even uh, if you, if you if there's something that actually like says weeks start on Saturday, that's fine. You don't need to send it to us because no, we we don't care. We're not. I it, reject the notion. <laughs> Blindly what is reject what it. is uh, she say on Arrested Development? Oh, if. If that's a veiled criticism of me, I won't hear it and I won't respond to <laughs> it. I won't hear it and I won't respond to it. Exactly. That's what I put in my dating profile I when I met Paris. <laughs> <laughs> so he knew he he could not say he did not know what he was getting into. From the get-go. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. At the end of the student's senior year, Larry took Claudia, Isabella, Yalitza, and Felicia to Pinehurst, North Carolina. There the group lived with Larry's 93-year-old stepfather. Larry put the young women to work, forcing them to install a drainage system on the property. Unsurprisingly, Larry accused the students of intentionally doing the job wrong and damaging the property in an attempt to sabotage Larry and his family. Larry would force the women to redo the work over and over, threatening them that if they didn't do it correctly, his stepfather would have a heart attack and die. Uh, one of the photos, there's several photos and pieces of video that are available from their time in North Carolina. And one of them was of Talia and her, the Larry's daughter and her grandfather 
And Grandpa looks like he's having a lovely time. I mean, smiling, He's joyful. got his family there. He also, I don't know. I mean, this is speculation, but I hope he doesn't know what's going on. Hopefully he just says, these are our friends yeah. that are coming to help and doesn't know that they're being forced out to sleep outside. But the other footage is of Felicia in her, it's so sad, one of them is her in her Harvard sweatpants. Mm-hmm. And in some of the other footage she has on her Columbia shirt. And it's just these sad like remnants of her previous life mm-hmm. where now she's got a shovel. And in one of the videos, she's begging, let me go back and work. Let me just go back and work. Which, if it's a choice between digging a drainage ditch and getting screamed at in the face by Larry Ray, give me the shovel every time. Yeah. And so it's just sad to know, though, that that's, they're not being compensated. Oh, no. And it's all under duress and threat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Larry's psychological and physical abuse continued at the Pinehurst home. Court filings obtained by the News and Observer allege that Larry forced the women to work in the middle of the night and to sleep outside in the summer heat. Additionally, he put a padlock on the refrigerator, only allowing them to eat when he said they could, repeatedly physically assaulted them, and threatened to have them put in jail. Or locked in a psychiatric facility. Uh, I, have I been to North Carolina? I don't think so. We're going to be going on tour. But I imagine it's akin to if we were forced to sleep outside in the Texas heat in the summer. And after having spent all day doing grueling manual labor to then deal with that and the mosquitoes and who knows what else. That's I mean, it's worse than a prison environment, at least in prison. You're getting a bed and getting Mm -hmm. to be in an air conditioned sometimes facility. And and food, at, yeah, you know, at a regular interval, and not just when someone just feels like you should have it. I imagine it's probably we will again we'll be there this summer, so we'll know. But uh, you know, maybe humid. It's near the ocean. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe there's an ocean breeze. But no matter what, they should not have been forced no. to sleep outside. I uh, have seen now pictures of both Talia and Isabella. Mm-hmm. It's shocking how similar they look. Almost. They look like twins, Almost or they identical. look like they could be like yes. sisters. Yes. So to know that he had a physical relationship with Isabella, sexual, sexual, that gives me even more pause to this whole thing. Yeah, there's, there's, uh, I mean, we're not shocked to say Larry Ray is a disgusting pervert, but right. having grooming. Choosing and grooming and obsessing over a woman that's almost, I ident- uh, say, a young, extremely young yes. woman that looks identical to your daughter is a another layer of creepy. And the same age as your daughter. Correct. Yeah. It was during the time spent at the North Carolina home that Yelitsa felt she could no longer endure the abuse and torture she had suffered for years. Larry called the police in October to report Yelitsa missing, one of the dozens of calls police received from the home during the group's stay there. After searching the area, law enforcement found Yalitza unconscious in the parking lot of a Staples in Southern Pines. She had swallowed an entire bottle of Tylenol in an attempt to complete suicide. Yalitza was taken to Mount Sinai Hospital. Her parents were notified that their daughter was alive, but in a coma. After she woke, Yalitza's parents had her transferred to a hospital near their home so they could visit her every day. Then one day, they were suddenly no longer allowed in their daughter's room and were told if they wanted to speak with the doctor, they would have to do so with Larry present. It appeared that after Yulitsa awoke from her coma, Larry had convinced her to give him control over her situation. Wow, for the parents again. This, and this is this, the parents where it's the three siblings, Yulitsa, Felicia, and Santos. Mm-hmm. And now your daughter is in a coma, and now you're being kept away from her. You finally think, okay, maybe this is the last shot. Yeah. Um, it's hard for me to say what I would do, but I have a pretty good idea of what I would do. Oh, to Larry? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, everybody has grace in the situation that they did not just uh, physically attack him. I mean, you maybe think, well, maybe if I attack him, I go to jail, then I look crazy. Then I'll get kept from my kid. You know, you try to work out all these circumstances. I mean, from a legal perspective, a lot of times parents get POAs, like powers of attorney for their kids that are going off to college, because once you're 18, Mm -hmm. your parents technically don't have uh, the right to your medical records and things and making medical decisions. But in the event that 
he had maybe he had had her sign a POA or a HIPAA release or something. I mean, as, or even expensive. not, you just the doc. She tells yeah. the doctors, "I don't want my if my parents show up, they're not allowed in here. They're the reason I did this. Larry yeah. is the only person that I I want in this room. I mean, what their hands are tied." I saw. I would say it's expensive, but aside from going to get a guardianship or conservatorship, where you have to, you know, get a third party, yeah. a guardian ad litem to represent her interests, Larry would then be cut out of the situation. But it's like cost prohibitive, and mm-hmm. it's a very stringent circumstance. Of course, it's like a Britney Spears type of setup that you would, I hope, you know, say, okay, it's a temporary conservatorship, but it's such a huge undertaking that. I mean, that's not even on your mind. Your mind's just like, I want her to get better. And you shouldn't have to do something like that because a cult leader shouldn't, you know, he should, he's the one in the wrong here. How long would it take to, for that to be approved if you did that? You can, sometimes you could get a temporary conservatorship in 24, 48 hours, maybe a couple days. That would probably be the route I would go. And, you know, try to, but if she's awake and he's coached her enough to yeah. where she seems like she's aware of her circumstances, can provide for her own daily needs, isn't a danger to her, you know, yeah. is she still a danger to herself or not? But it would just be up to how much she's been coached by him to kind of pretend that she didn't need it. It's That's yeah. hard. It's such a rock and a hard place. Even when there are legal options, you see somebody that has now been, had so much time to obtain so much control over another adult that it's really hard to unwind. And the I mean, parents, impossible. And the parents have already lost contact with all their kids. I'm sure you're worrying, well, if we do something this extreme, that's it. We're never going to get her back again. It's You're also in just like complete survival mode. Everybody's been held hostage here yeah. by him. Yeah. So, And any choice you make, it doesn't matter. There's always going to be what if, I should have, could have, whatever. So every choice is, in theory, the right choice because you did what you thought was best at the time. Mm-hmm. The following year, Claudia and her parents underwent the same trauma after Claudia was also hospitalized for intentionally trying to overdose on Tylenol. Her parents were not allowed to see her without Larry present. Claudia's mother told the cut that she asked a nurse, What is he doing here? The nurse replied, This is not the first time that we've seen him. So here's another question. Is is because they're an adult... A reason why if the nurses or doctors suspected something was going on, they couldn't notify police? There's really no one to report to. I think if you thought it was like a domestic violence situation, you could report that to police. But if he's in there, probably turning on whatever charm he has and saying, oh, I take care of her. You know, we're together. We're in a relationship or I'm her mentor. I'm her friend. And you don't see him outright controlling, grabbing, manipulating her. The medical professionals don't have anything to report. If there's somebody in Texas, it's kind of three categories. It's adults over the age of 65, children under 18, and then any adult with a like, uh, disability. And so, like you know, it's, uh, if they have uh, mental incapacity or diminished capacity. So in that case, you know, I know lawyers are mandatory reporters. Actually, I think everybody in Texas is a mandatory reporter if one of those three categories, if, if you know of a person in one of those three categories who's been subject to abuse or you have reasonable suspicion of it. But yeah, since she's I don't think she would be categorized as having to diminish capacity. Obviously, she's an adult. She's not over the age of 65. I, I, but again, if they're saying from- this isn't the first time we've seen him, I mean, nurses are smart, and they know what to look 100%. for. If they've seen this guy in there twice now with a young woman who has tried to complete suicide, I, to me, that's a huge red flag that at least, even if there's nothing that they could do to call the cops and say, like, hey, this just seems weird. Yeah, and there's nothing to say that they didn't. And you you yeah. know, you hear about that sometimes where it's uh, a totally correct hunch, but there isn't sufficient evidence at the time to investigate it, so then nothing happens. Yeah. In 2014, Larry got into a dispute with his former landlord and had been evicted from the apartment on the Upper East Side. His former friend had become increasingly disturbed with Larry's behaviors and the things that went on under his roof. In addition to the inappropriate relationships Larry seemed to have with the roommates, he had also taken it upon himself to renovate the space. Huge pieces of expensive machinery were brought into the apartment. Neighbors and the HOA complained about construction noises coming from the condo at all hours of the night. When Larry decided to remove the doorknobs from both bathrooms, preventing anyone from having any privacy, the landlord had enough. 
And also, you any of those videos and photos of the both the apartment and the other places where they move, there is shit everywhere. Oh, God. It's like a construction site. There's just like cans, bottles, food. There's packaged paper goods. And it, maybe like they shopped at Sam's or something mm-hmm. or, you know, Costco. And then there's, yeah, like you said, construction sh- stuff, shovels, bags, weird. And it's, how do you even live like that? There's like little paths. They've yeah. like created little paths. The table, you can sit at the table, sit on the uh, beds and couches but other than that the floor the countertops everything is just covered and it's I feel like having that many people and that much stuff also contributes to again this feeling of like a prisoner oh yeah yeah and I mean that's also signs of not being mentally well and the sites in North Carolina and later New Jersey there's huge like um things you would see when people are, when construction workers are working on highways like that type of equipment like in the yards that they were using mm-hmm. to dig shit up so it it was wild. Yeah, it was not a clean or um, it did not look like an environment where people that were stable were, were living. It looked very hoarder-like and, chaotic. and very, very chaotic, which was indicative of all the things that were going on there. And plus, if you – just from the video footage that's available, the evidence – there's a lot of screaming going on, mm-hmm. a lot of thuds, bangs, bonking into walls, slamming doors, and then you add on top of that construction. I'm sure the HOA is ready to evict. Oh yeah, and he had Larry had asked the landlord, "Hey, you want to come be in this threesome with me and these two these two others?" So the, the landlord, who was a friend of Larry's from long before, I think eventually was like. Uh, shit's been weird for a while, but now it is just too much. We, I, yeah, I don't you know what go. you're doing, but you gotta go. don't do it here. Yeah, and it took still a year for him because yeah. evictions are not overnight. You can evict someone, and it still takes uh, can take up to a year for them to actually have to move out. So he's continued to stay there with them for a while. It's and the laws in New York are specifically tenant friendly, which most cases that's great. But in a case like this, you see where yeah. somebody can take advantage of the mm-hmm. situation. Refusing to go willingly, Larry countersued the landlord. At trial, three of the Sarah Lawrence students testified on Larry's behalf. The most disturbing testimony was from Claudia, who, despite having only met Larry at college, told the court she had heard tales of him since her childhood. She went so far as to claim that the former police commissioner of New York City, Bernie Carrick, had instructed her to poison Larry with arsenic, cyanide, mercury, silver, and lead according to the cut. Supposed confessions of poisoning went even further. Larry later filmed Claudia on a bed, confessing to poisoning to both him and Talia. He would then use this footage to blackmail her, threatening to show it to police and have her arrested. Claudia was also working as an escort at this point, something she would later say at trial Larry forced her into as a way to pay him back for the alleged damage she caused to his stepfather's property. More situations just like earlier on with the custody dispute of having this evidence of always wanting to have a paper trail. But he clearly planted these memories in her oh, yeah. mind where she said, when I was nine years old, I heard stories that Larry was being poisoned by Bernie Carrick. Like, From my grandparents. Did- yeah. And Yelitsa testified, too. And it was the, almost verbatim the same thing. My parents, I, I heard them talking about Larry when I was young and they um, were getting paid by government officials to for, to poison Larry. I mean, yeah, it, it went deep. He got deep, deep into their psyches. Yeah. And when she was on the bed, when they're filming this, she looks as if she has been drugged. Yes, and it's really disturbing footage. And then Larry later made it public and, the, and put it online with her name attached to what it. What an so idiot. I mean, this is well, how... We'll see. We'll egos, see how that led to his undoing. Yeah, but I mean, what an egomaniac that you think, oh, this will get her. Idiot. Yeah. And he's like, if any anytime someone searches your name, then they're going to know. In need of a new place to live, Larry headed to Piscataway, New Jersey with Felicia and Isabella. Isabella had already graduated, but continued to live with Larry. The trio showed up at the door of Scott Muller. Larry and Muller had served time together in the Somerset County Jail. Now, Larry was asking Scott if they could bunk up once again. Larry told him that he, Isabella, and Felicia had been poisoned and needed a place to recover, according to the intelligencer. And I'm sure, you know, at first blush, you say, we're all, we've all been poisoned. We need a place mm-hmm. to stay. And you want to do your 
Buddy a favor. Yeah. In exchange for letting them stay there, Larry promised to help Scott, an alcoholic, stop drinking. Scott's friends told the intelligencer that while Larry did help his former cellmate kick the bottle, it came with a price. Since they moved in, they've taken over his house, forcing out roommates, destroying his property, and incurring massive property fines, while at the same time making my friend feel like it was his fault for not acting the way Larry wanted him to. Scott felt trapped, but unable to do anything. Larry helped him to recover, so there is this feeling of indebtedness about that. But again, it's he's only doing it to serve his own yeah. greater good. He He's... That's how he traps him. Look at all these good things I did for you, and you're going to now kick me out? You're going to try and make me the bad guy? When I've He, he said that um, he was drinking like a bottle of vodka a day. He mm-hmm. was very uh, unwell, both mentally and health-wise. And, you know, and then he's like, oh, and the girls and I will help clean up your property, and we'll, we'll fix all these things. Another pattern that's his MO is he creates all this – emotional and physical destruction Mm -hmm. so then it's just chaos and then he has all these things to now accuse people of and blame people for to just continue like pulling them in and and making them feel like they're beholden to him it's also another form of control because you can tell scott well we'll leave as soon as the construction's Mm -hmm. finished well then you just keep doing and keep doing and keep doing you know it's never ending and the same with you know, North Carolina, well, we'll go home as soon as my stepfather's property is finished. But yeah. also we need to do this. And also we need, you know, he. it's just another way for him to, it's a guise of an, a, a date certain, but then he just keeps moving the goalposts. Like so many cult leaders. Mm-hmm. Both neighbors and friends of Mueller said Isabella would do yard work at all hours of the day and night, often scantily dressed, sometimes almost naked. This was just one of the many reasons local residents called police to complain. Just like renovations to the condo and work done at the Pinehurst property, Larry had destroyed Muller's property. Giant holes dug by heavy machinery filled the yard. A neighbor named Mike told the New York Post, They would tear it up, fix it, then tear it up again. Lots of people complained to the town about it. None of the neighbors knew what the hell they were doing. Inside the house, Larry had ripped up all of the carpet. Another neighbor told the intelligencer, The house was abnormal and that the people that lived there were strange this guy scott Mueller, at this point i don't even think he had a key to his house Mm -hmm. he he you know he he was um he told his friends like i'm trapped i feel like i am an outsider in my own home they've taken over the place you know there's shit everywhere you just you're it again and like we said in the last episode it's like the frog in the pot where it started off like we're going to help you. We're we're hurting, too. We just need a place to recover. And before you know it, there's so many holes in your yard that at one time when the cops were called out because of noise complaints, they brought canine out there because they were like, surely this guy's digging bodies because Something. or burying bodies because there's so much shit going on. So they had dogs sniff around. They had those huge like earth movers yeah, and yeah, stuff. Yeah. And, and you know, you say, well, where the hell did Larry get all this money from? Well, sadly we'll hear it, but he also owned, he like had a website business where he owned domain names or something. And he's also but, a con man who knows. Yeah. And he's worked in the construction industry before. Who knows what connections? He's- yeah. He knows, but you're like, you you're the neighbor and you think, Oh, Scott lives over there. He's a good guy. He's pretty quiet. Keeps himself. He has a roommate or two. And then, all of a sudden, there's a lady in a bathing suit, a bikini, underwear, whatever she's wearing, digging up the yard at midnight, and you're like, that's odd. And yeah. then a fucking earth mover shows up, and you're like, I'm trying to go to bed. Yeah, and I have kids. Maybe, mm-hmm. you know. When Mueller complained, Larry would berate him for not being grateful for the help he was trying to provide. When first questioned about the goings-on at the house by the New York Post, Mueller claimed that Larry was a friend. And that he was unaware of any legal wrongdoings. I heard about the allegations, but I mean, that kind of thing don't happen here. I mean, what happened in the past, I don't know. You know, that kind of thing doesn't happen, you know, under my roof anyway. After years of enduring his own abuse, Mueller changed his tune and filed a restraining order against Larry. While it kept him at bay for a while, Larry moved back in when Mueller allowed the order to lapse, according to the intelligencer. Well, and you know, he's just, Larry is very good at wearing people down. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's his actual job. That's what he's dedicated his entire life to. It's about the only thing he does. Yeah. 
More worried about their daughters than ever, Isabella and Felicia's mothers joined forces and visited the New Jersey home. When Larry refused to answer after they knocked on the door, the concerned parents called the police to conduct a welfare check. Officers spoke with Larry, Isabella, and Felicia. When the police returned to the moms, anxiously waiting in their car, they delivered the devastating news. Their daughters didn't want to see them, and if they came back to the property, they would be arrested for trespassing. Man, so close, but so far away. Just to be on the curb and know that behind that door, your daughter is suffering. They um, showed up together, and Isabella's aunt was also there. And they had decided ahead of time, we're just going to go and knock on the door, and hopefully they'll talk to us. And if they don't, then we'll call the cops. Well, they pull up. They said they saw uh, Felicia and Larry peeking out the windows, and then they Mm -hmm. close the blinds. They don't answer the door, so they call the cops. And when the cops go, Felicia and Larry answer the door, and they uh, one of the mothers said just to look on Felicia's mom's face that she was actually seeing her daughter for the first time in years. Like, she was smiling and so happy, but then it was so painful because she didn't want to see her. I mean, you're, you're looking at your daughter like 20 feet away. You can't hug her. You can't talk to her. It's, I, I mean, it's a pain that is just, I, I, I don't ever want to have to feel that pain. And I hate that anybody does have to feel that pain. Yeah. And I'm sure like you're, you just want to run up there and grab, yeah. you know, grab her and take her home and just to be stopped. And then you're That's- told if you come back, by the way, this is private property. So sorry. And they said that like 12 cops showed up when they called, probably because they're very familiar with the home. Mm -hmm. And one of the cops kind of, you could tell, took pity on them and wanted to help them out. But his his hands were just tied. But Mm -hmm. the other ones, they were just kind of like, they're adults. They can do what they want. They don't want to see you. Sorry. That's sad. Very. In May of 2019, journalist Ezra Marcus and James D. Walsh published an article in The Cut detailing all of Larry's various transgressions. They had investigated him for months and laid out how he inserted himself into the students' lives, the manipulation he used to control them, and his relationship with the students after they graduated. In interviews with the authors, Larry denied several allegations, but admitted to taking the proceeds from Claudia's sex work. Claudia also told the reporters that Larry tied her to a chair and put a plastic bag over her head, causing her to fear for her life. This was the final straw for Claudia. When she told her former employer about the terrifying incident, he immediately booked her a ticket to leave the city that night. According to the Department of Justice, over the course of her four years of sex work, Larry collected approximately $1 million from Claudia. Yeah, so Ezra Marcus went to Sarah Lawrence. Yeah, and then at the same time as, as one didn't of them. Didn't really know, didn't them. know them. Yeah. But he said that after the videos of Claudia admitting to poisoning Larry were made public, it was then, you know, people said, this is a person we knew. And it started kind of going around in the alumni circles of, do you remember her? And what is she talking about? And they said, oh, yeah, remember that guy that moved into the dorms all, you know, Mm -hmm. back when we were in school. And then that's when Ezra started poking around. And then he, James was his colleague. They started writing this together. And he said that at first Larry was kind of suspicious of him. But then there's recordings available on the the Cut website. uh, And we'll link it all in the show notes where they put the audio recording of phone calls that Ezra and James had with Larry and just how smug he Mm -hmm. is and how very open he is to admitting that, yes, he was telling Claudia to to participate in sex work and then give him the proceeds. And he's like, well, Claudia, she, you know, it's great. She seems to actually feel guilty about all the stuff she's done to me. So, you know, it's great that I'm going to get this money from her. And just extremely damning admissions. And the, I mean, it just lays it out. That's the work of a good journalist. So good. You don't, you just... You open the door for them to talk, and people like Larry want to talk. Mm-hmm. And you just shut up, and the more you shut up, the more they just spew forth everything. And I think it's a, a call with James, and he goes, all he has to say is, oh, really? And Larry goes, and yeah. just goes on this monologue, and he goes, oh, wow, goes on a monologue yeah. again. I mean, you're just sitting there going, record, like, this is all on mm-hmm. the record, and he is just giving him, giving him the whole deal. Writer James Walsh detailed his interactions with Larry in a 2021 follow-up piece. Walsh described the difficult challenge of interviewing the master manipulator, 
writing. Getting a straight answer from Larry was like trying to catch a feather in a hurricane. After finding out he had spent time with an accused sex cult leader, many people asked Walsh whether he could see Larry's appeal. Walsh wrote, The simple answer is no. I've never agreed with anything more. Yeah. Uh, it's it's hard because I think it's the, we've said it now a third time, it's the frog in the pot analogy mm-hmm. where you, you don't go, he is such a hot guru. I want to learn from him. You go, oh, it's my friend's dad. Yeah. Oh, he's going to give me some He's advice. harmless. I'll... I'm not even attracted to him because he's just a dad. So, yeah. you know, it's not even like you're, you're even thinking about that. Mm-mm. But it's also easy for us on the outside and these journalists to go into this knowing what we know. Yes. And are obviously the way we think of him is completely different than how they went into it. Yeah. When you you look at a photo of him and we put it in the on the Instagram post of the pictures of him sitting on a couch in a Sarah Lawrence T-shirt and he's smiling and he just looks like somebody's dorky yeah, dad yeah. that would probably tell you a pun and tell you about a cool time. He you know, when he was in back in my day, and we worked used to do with this. the FBI and the CIA and wax. No idea. Philosophy with you long into the night. Yeah. The story in the cut was rigorously reported and fact checked. However, Sarah Lawrence College refused to take any responsibility for what happened on its campus after an ex-felon moved into one of their dorms and began manipulating its students. The college said in a statement, In April 2019, New York Magazine published a range of accusations about this former parent. At that time, the college undertook an internal investigation regarding the specific activities alleged in the article to have occurred on our campus in 2011. The investigation did not substantiate those claims. What do you think this investigation consisted of? Mm, Them talking to the on-campus lawyer going, don't admit anything because we're not trying to get sued. Or talking to the students who were like, no, everything's great. Probably talking to the ones that maybe are he sitting there. Call up, Fel, you know, not Felicia. She didn't go there, but calling up Isabella on the phone, and he's mm-hmm. sitting in the room next to her. Or Talia, yeah, any yeah. of them. The Department of Justice and U.S. Attorney's Office had a different reaction. As a result of the article, an NYPD FBI Joint Task Force began investigating Larry and what he had supposedly done to the students. Law enforcement investigators substantiated nearly everything that had been reported. On February 11, 2020, Larry Ray was arrested at the home of Scott Muller. When police entered the home, he was in bed with one of the students. Larry was charged with sex trafficking, money laundering, extortion, and forced labor. The indictment released on the date of his arrest corroborated many of the incidents written about in New York Magazine. At his arraignment, at least 10 of his so-called students were there to support him, according to the New York Post. And, of course, after the arrest happens, then all the other outlets, New York Post, the Daily Beast, everyone starts picking it up. But it's wild that literally police were called to the house, parents called police, and it was not until these two dogged mm-hmm. journalists are like, we're telling this story. We were And, and told the, the victims, hey, we won't use your last name, but we want to tell your story. And that speaks volumes about how gentle and kind they were. It's almost like this is definitely makes me think of um, Chris Lambert and yeah. the, your own backyard where, so, you know, some people were reticent to talk to the authorities, but were willing to talk to a journalist, podcaster. And that is literally what launched this is that. Sarah Lawrence may have gone, we don't really believe the article. Meanwhile, the NYPD was like, let me get that. Let me get Mm -hmm. who are we needing to talk to? All right, we're going to go talk to him. It shows you the power of media when, Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of of good that comes out of two people that are just not on my watch. They make it their mission to, you know, I mean, cops and law enforcement. They've got thousands of cases, but when you have two journalists, one of which is tied even more personally to it because he went to that college when this was going on, Mm -hmm. you know, you have a vested interest. You're going to dig deep and you're going to pull out things that others can't. For sure. That's what we're going to do one day, Heather. Even after being arrested, Larry was not content to go quietly. He still attempted to exert control over his victims. When he caught wind that two of the female victims would be testifying at trial, Larry reportedly said in an August 2020 jailhouse call with his dad, That's never going to happen. What they're going on is not the truth. The U.S. Attorney's Office analyzed Larry's call and found that his father had also been providing the victim's whereabouts to Larry, according to the New York Times. I mean, both 
the stepfather and his parents are much older adults who knows what they're being told by this guy that his I mean, since he could walk, has been conning people. Mm hmm. And it did say the New York Times and the the uh, filings by the U.S. attorneys were, said his father. We don't know if it's his stepfather whose name he took or his biological father who he apparently didn't have a good relationship with. The article nine times said his dad, his dad, his father, his dad. So presu- I, we don't really know who he was talking to. It doesn't matter. The fact was he could not let go. Yeah, yeah. Locked up facing all these charges. I'm sure he knew he had left a huge trail of evidence, but would absolutely not let go of his victims. Was convinced that he was still not going to get in trouble. That This kind of like Murdoch, like mm-hmm. even yeah, like you're just in such denial that you did anything wrong. And like, oh, well, I've been getting away with this for years and everyone's been under my thumb. Why would it change now? Larry attempted to send coded messages to the victims via his father in an effort to intimidate them as well. For instance, he made his father remind the women that they had signed on forever. He also attempted to maintain his control over their associates, telling his dad, No new friends. There should be no one in anybody's life except each other. The New York Times reported the messages were meant to secure the victim's loyalty on the promise of marriage. In a complaint filed by prosecutors before trial, the assistant U.S. attorney wrote, These messages are plainly designed to tamper with witnesses and deter these women from cooperating in the government's investigation. The complaint went on to say, Most troubling, the calls suggest that Ray's ongoing communications are designed to ensure the ongoing loyalty of these women and to inhibit their ability to detach from the influence he commanded over them for nearly a decade. I didn't read anything that the father or stepdad, whichever one it is, was talking to the women or any of the victims to pass these messages on it's a that's a big thing to ask of your older father like by the way you need to keep tabs on everyone and make sure they're not getting any new friends i believe that it was written in the government's complaint that the father would say we got company or i'm not alone and then Possibly that indicated that the phone was on speakerphone. So, but, you know, on paper, Larry was talking to his dad because you're prohibited from talking to any of the victims. Oh. But, but if the dad says, oh, I have company, that was a coded message to tell Larry, they're listening. They're in the room with me. Mm-hmm. I'm going to put you on speakerphone. And then so he could exert his control over them, but really be like talking to his dad. Right. But he, he, was, he was just talking through his dad. Yeah. Yeah. These calls to victims came among cries from his attorneys to let Larry go home under house arrest. They made the request due to what his attorneys called his near total inability to confer with them due to COVID protocols. Given his aggressive pursuit of the victims, even from behind bars, the U.S. Attorney's Office strongly objected. In addition to the phone calls, the FBI had also seized compromising videos and photos of the two women Larry continued trying to contact. Given the disturbing nature of his behavior behind bars, Larry was not released to home confinement and remained incarcerated until his trial began. And I think the theory was, you know, from his defense attorney's side, they were saying, well, we can't actually, we need to go through a ton of discovery with him. We need to sit side by side with him in a room and go through stuff. And it was really hard for him to do that because of the COVID protocols and how much time he could spend with them and where he could sit with them. On the flip side, he's on the phone with his dad and, in theory, the victims, exerting control. And then in the discovery that the FBI has, he's, they see blackmail-esque footage, whether it's sexual. He, he had a habit of asking them to have sex with strangers mm-hmm. and to film it on iPads that he would give them. He would, as Felicia said, it was whatever was the most demeaning. He would say, go take a cab ride. And at the end of the cab ride, instead of offering to pay, offer to have sex with the cab driver. And if he says, yes, film it on this iPad and come show me. Well, then he would take that footage and have it. And he would be like, I'm assuming if you try to leave, oh, do you want me to show everybody? I'm going to put on the internet of you having sex with a cab driver or go to the Lowe's or the Home Depot or whatever, like the hardware store in North Carolina and ask one of the employees to go in the back room with you and go give them a blowjob. 
go suck them off and take an iPad and video it and come bring it back to me. So they found all this footage. They don't know, the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's Office, they don't know if they have the only copy of it. So you let him go home on house arrest. How are they to know that he's not going to re-victimize mm-hmm. all of the people that now they think they're safe because he's behind bars? Well, you let him out on house arrest because of COVID. Don't you feel so bad? Meanwhile, it's uh, the abuse would just continue. Yeah. Oh, Even if they yeah. weren't in the same room with him, he would still be able to exert control over their life and abuse them mm-hmm. by vir- virtue of all these photos and videos. It's disgusting, and they made the absolute right choice leaving his ass locked Oh, up. for sure. Isabella was one of the two victims Larry continued trying to control, according to the New York Times. But in the eyes of the government, she did not remain a victim. While Larry was behind bars, Isabella was indicted on charges including conspiracy and was accused of being a willing accomplice. Her aunt, Liz Jeffrey, argued that Isabella had been brainwashed, telling the New York Times, I don't care what they found. It's all under duress. She's been under his spell for 10 years. At her arraignment, Isabella's attorney stated that he was concerned with his client and that she may not be competent to stand trial, according to the New York Times. However, Isabella disagreed, according to her lawyers. She was ordered to undergo an evaluation and found competent to stand trial. Yeah, the competency is just going to ask whether you understand the nature of the allegations against you, whether you understand the possible, uh, you know, the possible sentence, the possible punishment for what you did. It's not, are you being manipulated psychologically by this person? It's a real Alice and Matt, Keith Raniere thing Mm -hmm. where a victim has now been such a victim over the long term that they have begun participating in the abuse. Yeah. And where do you draw the line of you're no longer a victim and now you're an accomplice? It's a great question. Larry's trial began in March of 2022 and lasted four weeks. Repeatedly, the trial was interrupted by Larry's alleged medical maladies. The first emergency ended with Larry being rolled out of the courthouse on a stretcher after he suffered what his attorneys called a seizure during proceedings. A week later, his attorneys abruptly called for a break during Claudia's testimony. Claudia had been telling jurors what Larry had done to her, including forcing her into sex work for four years. The defense interrupted her testimony so that Larry could be removed from the court for medical reasons. And there's photos of the paparazzi, by the paparazzi, of him laid out. And I'm sorry, the look on his face, he's a fucking terrible actor. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, trial experts will tell you it is, medical emergencies happen, whether with a juror or with one of the parties. But to have them that close together... That many times and like during some of the most damning testimony, it was, I think, and I think I'm right, one more way for him to exert control over Claudia. Yeah. Like, you're not going to tell your story. I'm going to stop you. I'm going to show you how. It's also like freezing the kicker in, in football. Mm-hmm. Like, you just keep calling time calling out. In the, if, if he does all this in the middle of like what is very harrowing testimony that the jurors are hearing, it possibly you know, decreases the effect it had on them because now all this shit got thrown in the middle of it, you know, and it and it it broke up the power of what she was saying. And to the credit of the defense attorneys, they at least, I don't know what they advised him of or if he's just not stupid enough to, like, flail around and fake something. So the jurors never saw him being wheeled off. They didn't see that the court keeps that out of the jurors' purview, and I believe the phrasing that the judge used when they came, they, you know, take the jury out, remove him on a stretcher, bring the jury back in. And the judge said, there was a medical issue. We're all going to go home. And they were all out of the courtroom so that he, you know, you don't see that Larry's missing. It's just like we had, it's a non, non-COVID non medical issue. We're going to take the rest of the day. We'll make up the time another time. You guys are dismissed early uh, to hopefully keep that from, you know, the, I don't think. That man could wear a neck brace, a fake <laughs> right. leg, broken thing. Nothing is going to make him be sympathetic no. when you hear the testimony and see the videos. But at the very least, somebody told him, you're going to cause a mistrial if you do this fuckery. If you're sick, tap on the desk and we'll call for the jury to be removed because otherwise we're going to have to go all through this again. So when when that happens and he, for instance, if they're like, tap on the desk, do they say, like, Your Honor, maybe we approach the bench and then they go up and they say, my honor, my client has a medical emergency. So then they say, okay, jurors are excused and then they just handle this while they're out of the room? Yeah, he's. I believe his attorney said, Your Honor, we need a brief recess. And then they led the jury out of the room and then he said, we're calling 911. He's having a medical emergency or whatever. My thing is, if he's having such a horrible seizure. Yeah, what a way to, what a magic 
What a magician to be able to control your seizure like that. Mm-hmm. Until, yeah. Uh, it, well, uh, here's the thing. It was bullshit. He didn't oh, have anything yeah. wrong with him, except for the fact that maybe they took away all of the amphetamines he was constantly yeah. downing. But he's, um, but he's been spewing this bullshit that he's been poisoned yes. for so many years. So now he's like, oh, look, I'm I'm so sick because of all the poisoning, all the mercury. You're not being poisoned. You're just a dumbass. But I also agree that it's another way for him to control even from there absolutely yeah it's it's a continuation of his mm-hmm. abuse sadly i mean it's you're legal to say i need to go to the bathroom i have a medical thing i need help but I, that it was bullshit he did it he did it to try to hurt her more when um i was on that jury mm-hmm. we all had to stop and everyone had to be let out because i had to pee no <laughs> you're the reason I was like, I did you can't. pass a note to the bailiff? I um, got their attention, and they came over. <laughs> and like, wave your hand. Excuse I me. think it may have. No, I feel like we were like about to break, or we had just come back from break. Which why I didn't pee then, I don't know. Something uh, that I got their attention. I was like, I have got to go to the bathroom, and so then we all had to leave. I was like thinking I could just go to the bathroom. But no, everyone has to get up and leave when that mm-hmm. happens. So From yeah. an attorney perspective, we want the jury to be focused on the testimony. I was not. In front I was like, I cannot focus on what is happening yeah. because my bladder is going to explode. No, you did the right thing because otherwise you're sitting there going, got to pee, got to pee, yeah. and someone is sobbing on the stand mm-hmm. and you're like, oh, shit, I missed what they said. So you, if you're on jury duty, anybody ever – let them know so you can get up and go so you can really give your attention. So you did the right thing. I had also been downing bottles of water and taking them in with me because I had allergies and I was coughing and I did not want to just be coughing constantly through the no. trial. So I was just, it was, I wasn't a bad spot. <laughs> but you did, did the right thing. Yeah. In the end, it all, it all worked out. Claudia testified of her harrowing experience, telling the jury, He slapped me in the face so hard I fell over, pulled my hair, strangled me, suffocated me, hit me. He threatened to put me in jail numerous times. He threatened to kill me on a memorable occasion. He threatened to cut my face, have me abducted and dropped in the Middle East. He threatened to blackmail people that I knew. He threatened to beat up my father. Some of the abuse was caught on tape. All told, the FBI had seized over 15 terabytes of data from Larry including more than 150,000 audio files, according to the Intelligencer. One of the videos shows Larry and Isabella torturing Claudia as punishment for getting too close to one of her clients. For hours, they suffocated her, stripped her naked, and physically abused her. At one point during the nightmare evening, Larry and Isabella got hungry and stopped to have hamburgers and onion rings before continuing the abuse. They put a dog leash around her neck and they pulled it on They threatened a waterboarder. They put a plastic bag over her head and threatened to suffocate her. It it was, I mean, it was uh, Guantanamo Bay style yeah. torture. And that's the night that she decided to leave, right? Yeah. Yes. And I, uh, there's, they just said a former employer. The way I took it, and perhaps I'm wrong, is that it was one of her clients. I wondered about that. And she kept pretty... Uh, pretty detailed records of who all mm-hmm. she worked with. She had a composition notebook that she actually would write the date, how she was feeling, what she did, people's names. There was a, a gaffe by the U.S. Attorney's Office that accidentally published her clients list, which should have been uh, uploaded to PACER, which is the digital documents for all the parties involved, but it should have been made private and it was not. But they took it Oopsie. down. But I, yeah, they took it down, but I think it was too late after, you know, of course, once one person sees it and copies it, it's game over. But yeah, it kept saying a former employer, but I wonder, like you said, if it wasn't one of the clients or the specific one she got to, you know, allegedly yeah. got too close yeah. to in Larry's eyes. And she called and told him what happened and he said, uh, I'm getting you out right now. Here's mm-hmm. here's a ticket and here's some money. And I believe she, I don't even know if she packed anything. I think she just left. And then Larry called, you know, police saying she's missing. I can't find her. And first of all, she's an adult. Just like mm-hmm. all the reasons your her their parents can't talk to them, she can leave. You're she's an adult. You you Absolutely. don't have. This isn't an Amber Alert situation. No, leave her alone. But he can't. He can't help himself. He wants to control her. Yeah. 
In addition to Larry's medical emergencies, Claudia was also forced to hear her integrity attacked. Defense attorneys tried arguing that Claudia enjoyed sex and BDSM, went to sex clubs, and has a problem with truth-telling in an effort to discredit her, according to the Daily Mail. Defense attorneys also argued that Larry was the victim, having been poisoned and physically attacked by the Sarah Lawrence students. Everybody is entitled to a good defense. (laughs) I knew you were going to say that. (laughs) However, this is a rough one because of 15 terabytes of data, including the videos. I will... will, uh, extend my deepest sympathies to the defense attorneys here. I, If I'm not mistaken, they were appointed. They're appointed federal defenders, yeah. which is a very difficult job. And I imagine when you have a client like Larry, if you go, hey, you should plead out and mm-hmm. maybe you'll just get the 15 years on the sex trafficking charges because you're fucked because we have written records and evidence, all of Claudia's written records and evidence. We have all you, this video, a, a ton of video of you physically abusing, forcing them to do the labor. And we have audio recordings of you in interviews with James and Ezra from the cut where he admits Mm -hmm. to the sex trafficking. That is, of all the allegations, everything he did I think was horrible, but the one that has the highest criminal penalty under federal law is sex trafficking, and that's the one that he freely admitted Mm -hmm. on audio recordings with the journalist. So as a defense attorney, you're probably like, hey, man, let's talk about a plea deal. I imagine when you have a client like Larry who is in any scenario extremely hard-headed and extremely controlling – you can only do what you can yeah. do, and you only can work with the information given to you, which is, they poisoned me. Yeah. And you're like, really? Do you have like evidence of that? Bertie Carrick told them to do it. I know in my heart. And you're like, fuck, I'm going to have yeah, to Yeah, there's this also, also like, you can go to the doctor and get a bunch of tests done, I imagine, to see if there's poisons in your blood. And none of that was presented. But when you're his defense attorney and they're showing footage of Daniel having his tongue held with a plier. I mean, it is gruesome. Hitting with a hammer, punching him in the gut. Just taking this, it looks like a meat tenderizer. Mm -hmm. And he's just punching him in the gut. And it's so sad. Daniel looks like a very sweet kid. And he's just like, oh, like taking these punches. Like, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very sorry. And he's like, apologize to everybody here. Somebody's filming it. There's other people in the room. They're all watching it. Nobody's stopping it. And I couldn't tell in the background if it was laughter or people were shocked that the people filming, but it is, he tells him, uh, with the pliers on his tongue, he's like, do you want me to do that with your balls? Do you like it when I wrap that thing around your balls last week? When I, when I, again, um, admitting he did that. Yes. Yes. So I, there's like not really an argument that he did a lot of these things. They made a big to do about having his tax attorney testify because he was also charged with tax evasion because the millions of dollars he got from Claudia and from the other students' families, he never reported that as income. Mm -hmm. And under the IRS code, income is all income from whatever source derived. They don't care if you found it in a paper bag on the street Mm -hmm. or you forced a person into trafficking. You were supposed to have paid taxes on that, and he didn't. I believe he didn't file a tax return in like five or ten years. And they were trying to argue that he was – he – was not responsible for failing to file taxes because he was going on the advice of his attorney. And God help this attorney who got up there and testified, oh, yeah, but he told me that she was doing sex work for him, and I told him that he didn't have to report that. What? There's a, I, can't even, I don't even have time to get into why all of that is incorrect and wrong. But they made this really big deal about trying to say, well, he, 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 he didn't do the tax evasion, though, because he got this bad advice. Why would a was lawyer like, go on the stand and say that under oath? I don't. I mean, is that know. grounds for getting your license revoked? Uh, maybe somebody could complain. I wonder if Larry wants to complain. He's like, this guy gave me bum <laughs> advice. Uh, but yeah, in, I mean, but I you, mean, admitting that. Well, you have you know attorney client privilege where you say he told me he's having this lady as a sex worker. I can't go. No one's going to imminently die. I can't break attorney client privilege. Yeah. I can advise him not to continue an ongoing criminal enterprise and say I can't assist you. I would argue that's probably an ethical violation if your client tells you, hey, I'm forcing this woman into sex work. I'd like your advice on how to continue doing this. He and probably go, didn't worry. say I'm forcing her. No, he probably said she's giving she, me money. She's, she wants to be doing – she owes me money and mm-hmm. she really likes this. And, you know, because they did bring her her diary into evidence and I don't think she was – in the mental state of mind to even really fully understand what was happening to her. Mm -hmm. So they used a lot of what she said against her and and some of it looked as if she was enjoying it. 
she was not in. She later said I was being forced into this, and she, yeah. you know, you say what you have to say and to get through the day, and not just lose lose your mind. So I mean, nobody can blame her for anything that went on. No, and who's to say that he wasn't reading that diary yeah. and she thought, boy, if I write something in here, he's gonna hit True. me with a meat cleaver, or put a bag over yeah. my head, or whatever. And you think, okay, well, I gotta write he or he, as if. I don't think it would be shocking to learn if he made her write that diary. He made her sit on a bed yeah. and say that she poisoned him and she never poisoned him. That's a him. good point. Who's he's just sitting he's... there over her shoulder while she's like, I right loved what, what I did today. Yeah. Write what you did today. And it said that she, uh, and and it, they don't ever identify, you know, of course it's all redacted and everything. But one of the things she said, oh, I, I effed a policeman yeah. in the ass today and he really loved it and I loved it and I said this and this to him and everything. And... Who, like you said, who's to say Larry wasn't like, write down what you did today. Mm-hmm. Say that you loved it and sat there and made her write it. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Oh, yeah, so, true. But yeah, I don't think, uh, uh, as much as I think everybody's entitled to a defense, as much as it is in your client's best interest to impugn the integrity of a adversarial witness, you know, you want to say, this person has no integrity. I don't know that enjoying sex and BDSM or going to sex clubs have any bearing no. on the fact that whether or not she's telling the truth. If you want to say... She said this before. She said this different thing now, and you're trying to impeach the witness. Completely fair game. I think accusing someone of in a negative fashion of enjoying sex and BDSM and going to sex clubs is slut shaming. And oh, I don't, yeah, I, I don't think that that to me that's irrelevant. They're trying and to draw a parallel between the two, but all they're doing yeah. is slut shaming. And also, sex work is real work mm-hmm. if you are doing it of your own because volition you want and you to want yes. to do it. She if was you're being, being forced, forced into it. No, to yes, give tortured. That hundreds of thousands of dollars Millions. for something that she w- did not even do, that she was accused of doing. So she's not even doing it to try and pay back an actual debt. It's just this uh, fake debt that she's been convinced that she has, she owes now. And it's all, and again, moving the goalposts. He's moving the goalposts mm-hmm. every time. And also, I, you know, I hate to say it, but he had, I don't hate to say it. I love to say it. He admitted all of it. Yeah. He admitted to doing this. He admitted to getting the money from her sex work and wanting her dog. to do it, encouraging her to do it, telling her how much to charge. Her name on the website where she advertised her services was a combination of his daughter's names. Yeah. So he had a hand in a lot oh, of stuff yes. that she was doing. Yeah, yeah. Testimony from other victims described Larry using pliers on their tongues or beating them with hammers while berating them and threatening them. These stories were also corroborated by extremely disturbing video footage, which the jury saw. Assistant U.S. Attorney Molly Bracewell's closing argument painted a powerful picture. When his victims were completely subdued, when they were under his control, he committed crimes to get them to pay. Extortion, forced labor, sex trafficking, obstruction of justice, financial crimes. The defendant did all of this for control, for his own greed and to increase his power to cement his position in the organized group that he led. The defense's closing argument accused the victims of lying about their experiences, despite there being audio and video evidence corroborating their stories in the terabytes of data the FBI had seized from Larry's own devices. In the end, the jurors deliberated for less than a day and came back with a unanimous verdict. On April 6, 2022, Larry Ray was convicted on every count, including racketeering conspiracy, a violent crime in aid of racketeering, extortion, sex trafficking, forced labor, tax evasion, and money laundering offenses. Larry faces a mandatory minimum sentence of 15 years on the sex trafficking charge, in addition to the sentences he faces on the additional charges. He is scheduled to be sentenced September 16, 2022. He is scheduled to die in jail. <laughs> So he gets at least 15 years. I think at this point he's 62. So as we all know, I'm not good at math, but 62 plus 15 is 77. Yes. So and then he's going to get stuff on top of that. So, yeah, I think it's I think there's a good chance he doesn't come back out. Yeah. I mean, the 
racketeering conspiracy carries a maximum life in prison. And if you'll notice in Molly Bracewell's closing, she said the organized group that he led. So you Mm. have to prove a concerted organized effort for things like this. And yeah, racketeering conspiracy is a maximum life in prison. The conspiracy is a maximum 20 years. Extortions max 20 years. Sex trafficking is maximum life in prison, minimum of 15 years. The forced labor is 20 years. Forced labor trafficking is 20 years. Conspiracy is 20 years. Uh, he violated Bye-bye. the travel act. Yeah, four counts of tax evasion. He's Each done. count of tax evasion is a maximum five years. And then the money laundering is a max 20 years. No. Bye bye, asshole. Yeah. Rotten he's gone. jail. He's going. And plus, you do not have, he didn't plead. He's not helping his case. He does right. not at all seem to give a shit. He no, he's not seem... remorseful in the least. He doesn't think he's done anything wrong. He has not helped the government. He no. shows zero remorse. And these are all things. In fact, under he's the wasted sentencing. everybody's time and money by making this even go to trial. Yes. And yeah, waste re victimize all the victims over mm-hmm. and over, was trying to talk. So a ton of the stuff that where you would normally see it would possibly go in your favor in the sentencing guidelines. He's done the opposite of those. And you are now aggravating the judge and the system and the you know, whenever they look at it and they go, Well, here's the guidelines and you really check a lot of the boxes to get the maximum. Do you think ever the defense attorneys are secretly glad they lost a case. I'm sure. I mean, they have souls, right? I, right. I think, again, your your job as a defense attorney is not to, like, get your guy off no matter what means mm-hmm. necessary. Everybody deserves a fair trial. Your job is to ensure that the government does its job and proves its case on every element of every single charge beyond a reasonable doubt. And there are some times where, in this case, they did all—I mean, you do what you can do, mm-hmm. but there was hard evidence for all of these crimes. Again, he's on audio recording saying he accepted this money. Well, okay, can you show us a tax return where you claimed all this money? Oh, you didn't? Okay, there's tax evasion. You know, so there's video of him holding the kid's tongue with pliers and beating him with a hammer. And saying, you know, go out and work on the yard or I'm going to beat you more. Well, there you go. That's forced labor. That's violent crime in aid of your forced labor and your racketeering. So the all of the elements of all these crimes, I mean, obviously the jury found that, but are proven beyond a reasonable doubt. So you as a defense attorney go, I did. I was there. I did all I could. I presented the evidence I could. They did not have Larry testify, which I think was very smart because he is oh, yeah. a piece of shit asshole. And it, after you see him beat the shit out of people in videos, what are you going to go? Hey, so in that video, yeah. you were yanking that kid's tongue out with the pliers. Can you give us a reasonable explanation for what? There is no explanation. You know, to he, someone- you know he, they had to like convince him not to. I'm sure. Oh, God, I would have loved to see that cross, though. I mean, he and he's an idiot and doesn't I mean, as as much as I say he's an idiot, I mean, I think he's clearly calculating and manipulative. Yeah. But I think he's so egotistical yeah. that I imagine he would have said something on the stand during direct examination that would have opened the door during cross to extremely damning evidence. Mm-hmm. And so his defense attorney is not putting him on the stand. Excellent idea. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's still the the effect is what it is. He still got convicted. But I think that could not have helped him. No. Whatsoever. No. Not have helped him at all. No. Absolutely not. Talia was described as a co-conspirator at her father's trial, but has not yet been charged. The New York Post reported in 2020 she was living in North Carolina near her grandfather's home. Talia's Twitter is set to private, but her public bio is a message for her estranged younger sister that names the girl and says, I love you and miss you every day. XOXO always. Your big sister. Daniel has written a memoir called Sloanham Woods Nine that tells the story of how a group of friends were led from campus to a cult without the world even noticing. He told The Cut that he realized he had been in a cult after stumbling onto a website that listed tactics cult leaders use to control their victims. Yeah, he said he was just reading it and every single thing is like, oh, Larry did that. Oh, Larry did that. Yep, that happened too. And then by the end of it, uh, a bulb goes off. I was in a cult. Yeah. And I was it, I believe it was Daniel who in the interview said even therapy was difficult for yeah. him because it was the same tactics Larry used to try to get manipulative information, mm-hmm. you know, manipulate information out of him. Even though it's now a safe space, that's still probably really triggering that oh, you're like, sure. well, the last time I talked about all this. He also said he it's really hard for him to go to parties because he's always fears that he can't leave. Like, I mean, the mm. PTSD that all of these people must suffer and the ongoing trauma and triggers is, I mean, that's a lifetime of therapy. Absolutely. Isabella, who has been described as Larry's lieutenant, 
and has also been named as a co-conspirator, is scheduled to stand trial later in 2022. She's the one holding the phone in a lot of those videos. And, you know, it's the one where Felicia's in the garage and she's, you know, just in a complete state of distress is, you know, kind of trying to slap the phone out of Isabella's hand. And the language Isabella uses is so coached and just regurgitated. Felicia, you are a danger to yourself. You are in my space. You are assaulting me. Please stop assaulting me. So then, you know, I mean, it's all these buzzwords of assault. You're a danger. You're out of control. Oh, well, now we have this all on film. We're going to call the cops and show them how you were abusing us. We're the one. We're the victims here. No, for sure. And she she sounds like a mini Larry, which yeah. you ask yourself, if you're put in the position where you're either going to be body slammed on the ground and have Larry on top of you, you're going to be put in a chair with a leash around your neck and a bag over your head, or you do everything he says and you become a mini version of him yeah. to survive. Probably that's why she chose that yeah. that path. Uh, it's the same moral gray area we asked with Allison Mack. Like you said, if you've been victimized so long over so many years and you've been broken down, are you really in charge of your own actions anymore? I think uh, according to the the court analysis, yes, she's competent for what, you know, hopefully like with Allison Mack, you know, you plead out, you say, what can I do to help? Although the door, the window is kind of closed on that. Like if she really wanted to be helpful, you know, you go and you help the prosecution build their case or but in this case, I think it's maybe trying to save your own skin. You know, it's it's more survival. She's been trying to survive for the past, you know, 10 plus years. And she's still indoctrinated. I mean, that's a mm-hmm. hard thing to let go of for if when you've been in a cult for that long and been under that control to just, you know, get over it. You, that just yeah. doesn't happen. You know, you deprogrammed. Have to, yeah, you got to be deprogrammed. There's another video that's real hard to watch where it looks like a laptop is set up for uh, filming it and Felicia is sitting on a couch and Santos is standing over her and just slapping himself repeatedly mm-hmm. in the face. Very, very hard. And the uh, description of it was Larry was forcing him to do it or what Santos said. Uh, he was forcing him to do it to make Felicia stop reacting. Some kind of control thing where like, You know, you need to have control over your emotions. Do not react to what he's doing. And she, I mean, the tension, she's just like physically about to crawl out of her skin. She's like slapping the the couch. She's clenching her fist. She's like all over the place. At one point, Larry like walks into frame. So it's clear he was there and then walks back out. And then when the video ends, somebody, and it kind of looks like Isabella, like, walks up and they're in front of the laptop and they like do something and hit end. So she's also there and watching this and, you know, being told to film it or, or something. So I think it's going to be an Allison Mack situation where they're going to say, yes, you were a victim, but at some point you also became complicit in this. And I, I don't think her sentence will of course be near what Larry's is, but she'll probably get something. I think so. And, you know, hopefully if there is the cooperation and anything that she can provide as far as uh, remorse, any of that stuff. And and that is a mitigating circumstance. If you, you know, you plead and say, you know, I did it, but it was under duress and I feel really bad about it. And here are the ways that I want to make amends. That could go to lowering her sentence. Mm -hmm. But who knows the extent to which she's indoctrinated and possibly still indoctrinated that, you know, we heard about him trying to contact her while he was in jail before who's to say he's not still trying to contact her exactly well we just talked a lot about what we think but just because of continuity that i know you love so what do we think you you think anything else no i think uh, a lot a lot a lot of credit has to go to the reporters of the cut ezra marcus and james d walsh they're you know, a few, aside from the victims who were brave enough to testify and tell their stories, Ezra and James are really the heroes of the story as well, because without their bravery to tell the story, I mean, and also New York Magazine and The Cut uh, supporting them and saying, yes, run with the story. We'll give you the resources and fact checking it and everything. Uh, this would not have been told. I don't right. think this was Larry Ray of a little bit, you know, before this was, you know, because he got beaten up in 2015 by. Somebody, it was a... Tomaso. Like yeah, it was like a political guy, thing. Big political and then, construction guy. 
he was like well known because he was the one that ruined Bernie Carrick. Mm -hmm. So he was known, but he wasn't a public figure. It wasn't going to be something that was going to come out that without these two extremely dedicated journalists, I, uh, the NYPD FBI task force probably would not have gotten gotten wind of this or would have gotten such piecemeal parts like they were getting of maybe a report from a nurse here, a phone call to the police there across jurisdictions. But when you have a it's literally like, here's your case we wrote for you. Oh, by the way, here's all the witnesses you need to interview. Mm -hmm. Boom. I mean, they handed them, they handed the FBI Larry on a silver platter. Yeah. And for that, I'm sure all the victims and their families are probably very grateful. Yeah, I definitely, I mean, all obviously Isabella and perhaps um, a few others are still, you know, under his spell, but I hope that those like Claudia and, and others that testified are getting the much needed help that they need and are mending relationships with their family and on a road to recovery. For sure. We love providing Sinister Hadoo at no cost. So if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you'll also get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group for those in the Ruling the Airwaves and Getting Into It tiers, a special shout-out on the show, a monthly bonus mini-sode, and patron-exclusive video and audio content, including Am I the Asshole, Relationship Advice, Judge Christie, Dear Sinister, What a Drama, True Crime Headlines, and so much more. And patrons in the Getting Into It tier are also able to vote on a bonus content segment each month that they would like to see live-streamed, and they get to choose one of the full main feed episodes that we cover every month. And their voting is going on now, and next week's episode will be chosen by them. It's a... Uh tight race but i think one is going to edge it out just slightly they're all three good options though mm -hmm. so i'll, I'll be and pleased three, with any of them all three were uh listener submitted there you go you also have the fun perk of access to our discord server where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime share personal ghost stories or just post adorable pictures of your pets we hop on occasionally and we host monthly q a's on crowdcast where you can ask us all your burning questions and my God, was this last one uh, righteous? Of burning. Was it not righteous, Heather? It was righteous, my dude. <laughs> I was going back to find the the part where the feed cut us off at two hours because God. we overstayed our welcome. And uh, before that, I fast forwarded to the part where you said something that made me laugh so hard that I fell out of my chair. <laughs> so it was so funny. Uh, it was a well, time, man. I'm man. I got to go back and watch all of it because uh, it's. I'm just thinking about it. I laugh, and all everyone on um, Patreon is commenting like, "I am dying at work." Everyone's looking at me. I'm crying on the way to work because this is so funny. It I was, found the it was a lot. <laughs> I don't remember what you said or what we were talking about. That I did a spit take, and I literally spit a full mouth of water all over my desk. <laughs> yeah. So then there's a portion of the video where I'm just, I don't know what you're talking about, but I'm just looking around helplessly because my <laughs> mouse is covered in water. I'm like, my mouse, my mouse is wet. <laughs> I think I remembered what I said, but okay. I'm going to leave it to um, others to go hear that for their, for themselves. I don't want to spoil anything. Cause it was the time. It yeah. You'll hear time. some stuff on um, the best of Patreon this month too. Yeah. But <laughs> I don't even you, know it's how I'm really, going to choose. Even if you just, do it for that and yeah. then cancel. Yeah. It is worth the price of admission, in my Just opinion. For that it's, true. <laughs> if you think about it, too, it's about two hours and it's 15 minutes. So you, it's a lot of entertainment. It's like, it's like going to a movie. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> for patrons not in the U.S., you also have the option to pay in pounds or euros, saving you the cost of the conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available. Those that select this option will be rewarded with a free month of membership. For more detail on all of this and specific member tiers, visit SinisterHood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. And make sure you stick around after our sign-ups to hear your shout-out and our thank you corner. So many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. And if you want some cool Sinisterhood swag like t-shirts, mugs, totes, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Shop on the top banner. Also visit Sinisterhood.com and click on Live Shows to find tickets to all of our live shows on our tour this summer. They're going fast. 
Get them while you can. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your podcast. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod and like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. We're also on TikTok and YouTube. Christy, where are you at on the computer? I am on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace and on TikTok and YouTube at <laughs> I am not on YouTube. I am on TikTok and Twitter at Christy or GTFO. I probably am somewhere on YouTube, but it's not anything I upload. I know where you're on YouTube. <laughs> Oh, the Judge Vonda Bailey thing? Support court with Judge <laughs> Vonda Bailey. For anyone that goes and looks that up, it was all st- and it was all a bit. It's all acted. Tommy and I are fine. <laughs> uh, you're also not a surgeon. Sorry to break it to everybody. Well, that's not true. I am. I'm <laughs> Moonlight as a surgeon. <laughs> you're like I've per- I've conducted surgery. I I'm have. just technically legally not a surgeon, but I have done surgery. <laughs> um, I'm on the computer at Twitter at MCK versus the world and on TikTok and Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shoutouts. Megan Shupp. Laura Rossbrug. Molly Lasenko. Marjorie LaJoli. Shawnee Griffin. Megan Doherty. August Moreau. Ryan. Christina Dennis, Elise Esperanza, Pavla Sabakov, Jenna Lazaro, Victoria Buckus, Myra Gama, Jasmine Foster, Laura B, Lindsay Simonton, Nicole Baguski, Chrissy Kern, Lisa Dretsky, Megan, Bo Marie West. Hey, Thank you. What's up, Miss Chicago? you. Yep, we will see you in Chicago shortly. Jordan Rebecca, Jessica, Sarah, Alexis Myricks, Stephanie Keck. Suzanne Mascaro. Susie Mascaro, I love you. Aww. Susie and I went to college together, Aww. in theory. We went to different colleges, but at the same time. And we're BFFs. <laughs> Is that how that works? Yes, we went well, to college together. Well, then I together. went to college with a lot of people. <laughs> we all, in theory, everybody went to That's college. That's true, yeah. <laughs> Alyssa Bacon. Alicia Clark. Emily. Heather Hansen. Shanna Goodman. Steph. Melanie B., not the Spice Girl, although isn't that exactly what the Spice Girl would say <laughs> to throw us off the scent? Every time. Kaylee MacBrenner. Malia Canover. Lisa Janes. And Kalani Berry. And now, on to our thank you corner. I'm holding in my hand a gorgeous book. It's called The Science of Murder, The Forensics of Agatha Christie by Carla Valentine. And this was sent to us by Madeline Brown of Source Books because Madeline is a longtime listener. She used to work at the library. She said we got her through many a shift Uh, organizing books on book stacks and now she works for source books in chicago which is shout out to chicago we're about to be there and she thought we would enjoy this book and so it's all about how agatha christie used science in writing her books and how some of her cases in that she wrote about are based on real Mm -hmm. um or some of the stories she wrote were based on real cases yes and the the cover art i love Mm-hmm. It's so super nice. fascinating. It's on sale May 24th, 2022. So it's an advanced reader copy. Oh, so and special. honestly, I was going to say, I feel very fancy having an advanced reader copy <laughs> uh-huh. of anything. So on May 24th, 2022, grab yours if you like Agatha Christie, murder, murder stories, or science. It's fun for the for everybody. For everybody. It works for everybody. Yes. Thank you so much, Madeline. And thank you so much to all of our patrons. We could not do this without you. We sincerely appreciate it. Stay safe. Stay healthy and keep it creepy. Wah-ha-ha.